Yeah, we will be using PyTorch quite a lot in this class and I assume you will also be using it extensively for your class projects. So in this video I want to briefly show you where you can find out more information about PyTorch, like beyond the scope of this class if you ever need it. So um, also I want to briefly summarize what PyTorch is again. So PyTorch is yeah, a deep learning library for, Pytor, uh, for Python. And as you have seen, it's quite similar to NumPy. So there are these tensors and in NumPy with the multidimensional arrays, which are essentially the same thing. But yeah, beyond that, PyTorch has some convenience functions for deep learning. So uh, yeah, I have a summary here, like PyTorch at a glance. So PyTorch is based on Torch 7, which was a deep learning library, very popular like five to 10 years ago, but it had one big weakness. It was implemented based on Lua. Lua is a programming language. Um, I think they chose it because it was convenient to work with C files in the context of Lua, and Lua was very similar to Python. However, the weakness is <laughs> it's not Python, and uh, lots of people prefer really working in Python. So um, around 2016, efforts started like porting Torch 7 to Python and the project was then called PyTorch. So PyTorch initially used a lot of the Torch 7 code, but it got gradually replaced by a yeah, more, I would say, rewritten code later on. So, but originally PyTorch started as um, yeah, a library based on Torch 7 that was then, but also compatible to Python. And one of its focuses is really on the flexibility uh, and minimizing the cognitive overhead. So there are two aspects. You can make a programming uh, framework really easy to use by abstracting away all of its complexity. However, one problem is also then if you, if you make it too simple and provide uh, certain building blocks, it will become hard to do some custom research where you, for example, have to develop your own layers and things like that. So PyTorch has like um, a somewhere in between. It uh, minimizes the cognitive overhead, so keeps keeping things simple, but it also provides you with um, flexibility for research. Um, yeah, so the core features of PyTorch are automatic differentiation. So this is like uh, when you have a computation, you can automatically compute the derivative. So you don't need to know much math for that, which is very convenient. Um, and also, yeah, it has these dynamic computation graphs. In contrast to dynamic computation graphs are static computation graphs. And there were some libraries before that, uh, for example, Theano or early versions of TensorFlow, which were static. So, and that was not very convenient to work with. So you had to define a computation and then after you defined the computation, you could run it. But then it was really, yeah, a little bit uh, hard to debug if you had a problem in your computation graph because it was very abstract. So in that way, um, PyTorch has this dynamic approach, which is more similar to NumPy, where you, yeah, you uh, execute some line of code or you define the computation, the code, and it immediately runs. You don't have to um, compile anything, a graph or something like that. So in that way, uh, it's way easier to work with. Uh, but I should say this is nothing like PyTorch invented. They uh, were inspired by the Autograd API in another library called Chainer. For some reason, Chainer never really became that popular, although they actually pioneered this um, API. So Autograd is uh, yeah automatic differentiation. So Autograd for automatic gradients. It's also a sub library inside PyTorch, as we will see later um, yeah today. So yeah, and PyTorch also has NumPy integration, so you can convert NumPy arrays into PyTorch and the other way around. However, usually, yeah, we try to avoid using NumPy when we are in PyTorch because, um, yeah, it, it makes certain things a little bit clunkier if we have to convert back and forth. So usually we keep using PyTorch tensors as long as we can. Sometimes it's necessary to convert it for, let's say, exporting results into other tools, but usually, um, yeah, we can nowadays use most of the um, stuff implemented in PyTorch to do most of our work. I should say also one more thing about how code is implemented in PyTorch. So most of the code under the hood is written in C++ and CUDA. That is why PyTorch is also very efficient compared to regular Python code. So C++, as you know, is a low level language, uh, very efficient for scientific code. And CUDA is kind of like similar to C++, but it's a language especially for the GPU. So it's, you can think of it as C++ for the GPU. It's like 
uh, yeah, a simple or simplification, but it's essentially you can think of it like that. And Python really um, is like more like a wrapper around the C++ and CUDA code, making everything convenient. So I call that the usability glue. It's like some glue, putting <laughs> gluing together C++ and CUDA um, to make it easy to use. Um, yeah, so just briefly, why is uh, why are we using PyTorch and not NumPy if both are actually also very similar as we have seen in previous lectures? So really, um, why we use PyTorch is really we have GPU support, which is important for training deep neural networks in a time efficient manner. So it can be hundreds, thousand times faster than uh, training on the CPU, for example. Um, then yeah, also it has additional functionality to distribute actually computations uh, across multiple devices, like multiple GPUs even, which can also be um, yeah, super helpful for especially very large models. And then there's also the aspect of keeping track of the computation graph and the operations created um, that created them. So NumPy doesn't do that. So uh, it can be a blessing and a curse. So if you don't need a uh, computation graph for, let's say, computing gradients, it can be yeah, memory intensive to compute this graph. But most of the time when we do deep learning, we want to yeah, uh, differentiate results. And for that, we can have this um, graph that PyTorch builds in the background for yeah, differentiating it for computing gradients for minimizing the loss function with respect to the weights, as we will see later. And also, um, yeah, we can deactivate this computation graph. So it's not um, necessary to have that. So we can actually use also PyTorch without that computation graph, as we will also see. So um, it's really like a really great, uh, nice, convenient framework. It's, it's essentially NumPy with additional convenience functions that make our life as deep learning researcher much easier. Also, yeah, I should say, um, yeah, this is the official website and we will also, I will highlight some aspects from it, like uh, tutorials and uh, documentation and further resources and so forth. So this would be the main website if you want to learn also more about PyTorch, the main website to visit. Oh, I, sh I should also say one more word about, yeah, the speed, the speed of PyTorch. So according um, to the Deep Learning with PyTorch book, which was written by Eli Stevens, um, Thomas Fiemann and um, Louis Antigua, if I remember correctly. So um, some of them, are, they are basically main, uh, yeah, main contributors also to PyTorch. I think Thomas Fiemann especially, and I have a lot of experience with this um, framework. And according to this book, um, based on experiments or based on their experience, taking Python of the out of the computation loop only improves performance by up to 10% because you don't have to use PyTorch only in Python. Uh, there is nowadays a uh, intermediate representation. Uh, it's called a uh, Torch IR and there is also a C++ API. So you can use PyTorch code or Torch code in C++ only. So just using it without any Python and the performance is not much different. So this is basically saying that Python is not really detrimental to the performance because some people say okay python is such a slow language why would we want to do deep learning in it actually it turns out um, python is really i mean it is really slow compared to other languages but since everything is implemented in c plus plus and cuda anyway there's not much um, that really uh, is performance prohibitive in python so it's really d doesn't matter whether we run it in python or not the only reason why um, there's also a c++ api for uh, torch is for example not all devices support python runtimes for example if you think of a cell phone or a, like a smartphone there you don't really have a pytorch uh, sorry a python uh, um, runtime so sometimes it can be useful to use the c++ api it is possible though and also very easy nowadays to convert let's say from the pytorch python model into the c++ um, api so there's this intermediate representation that i mentioned and also on the website they have tutorials for converting between those so if you ever need to implement a model let's say on a mobile device it's not an issue that's what people nowadays uh, also do very routinely it's kind of yeah very very easy um 
installation wise i posted about that on canvas i think it was last week with um yeah, some write-up and recommendations just to summarize it again um if you have a laptop i recommend to not uh, not run this on the gpu because yeah honestly unless you have a high-end gaming um computer with a geforce uh sorry yeah, it's, i think geforce uh, nvidia graphics card then it will probably get too hot if you run it on a GPU, even if you have a compa compatible graphics card. Personally, I uh, use only my laptop for debugging. So I usually write all my code on the laptop first, see if it runs on the CPU. And then there's only a very simple switch that we have to make. I can show you to you later in the code. It's like one line of code and then everything runs on the GPU. And after I made sure that it runs on my laptop on the CPU, like for a very, like five minutes, very short time, then I would, let's say, run it somewhere else on the GPU. So my computer, personally, I only install the CPU version. And in order to find out how you install it, I also recommend you to visit um, the your PyTorch website and they have, if you scroll down like this menu here where you would select uh, the version. So I recommend uh, the stable version, then your operating system. Uh, personally, I have a Mac, but of course you can also use Windows or Linux if you have either of those operating systems. I use uh, Conda for the installation and uh, yeah, Python. So you have also the C++ or Java APIs here. And I don't use CUDA. CUDA is the yeah, graphics card library that I mentioned, the C++ library for the graphics card. I don't use that one. Yeah, and then I install it like as follows. And notice there is also Torch Vision and Torch Audio, which are yeah supporting libraries for computer vision and audio data. So we will work with Torch Vision also later in this course. So I just recommend actually installing all in one go. So then you have all everything together. If you have a desktop on Linux, that is, for example, uh, one of my computers, uh, a server I have, it's not at home, for example, it's like in a separate location. I usually only log in via the terminal, but there I would, for example, install a GPU version, and then I would install also the latest uh, CUDA version, but you have to make sure if you do that, that you have a compatible graphics card. It is uh, has to be an NVIDIA card. And also it has to have a certain driver version to support CUDA here. And for this course, I will um, on Thursday show you some websites where you can use a GPU for free. So also for this course, you don't need to have like a really lot of GPUs or th something like that. It's really um, only, it's sufficient to have a, uh, access to a free GPU for this course. We, we really focus on yeah, understanding deep learning and running some yeah introductory deep learning models and yeah we are not um, like a big company running like thousands of computations on GPUs in this class so for that way or for that manner you don't have to buy anything for this class I will show you on Thursday how to utilize some free resources okay oh yeah also one little tidbit here um, because there was some message I got also on canvas uh, yeah on Piazza uh, private message where some students uh, tried to import um, PyTorch. So there's one quirk. If you import PyTorch, note that it is import torch and not import PyTorch. So that's like something to keep in mind. It's a little bit confusing. I think it's because originally it comes from torch, torch 7, like I mentioned, and it, PyTorch is just the API. So I guess this is why the designers made the choice to import it as torch and not PyTorch. All right. So um, yeah, I wanted to mention if you go to the website, here, there's a tutorials link. There are lots of useful tutorials out there. Of course, you don't have to read them, but I recommend to check out one of them, which is the Deep Learning with PyTorch 60 Minute Blitz one. So there's a short video and there's a, yeah, a short run through like using PyTorch and has a good explanations, I think, to get you started with PyTorch. But of course, in this lecture, I will also explain things to you a little bit differently. So I recommend though, um, after this, class here after this lecture i also recommend you to read through this tutorial it's a really nice one yep that's this one there's also a pytorch book now so this is yeah by um eli stevens luca antiga it's an old screenshot uh, i think thomas Feeman is also Feeman is also a co-author on this book so you can find the version here on this website it's uh yeah available for free uh, and there's also a print version that is available via the publisher. 
Um, I should also say there's a very, very nice um, friendly uh, community around PyTorch. So if you go to the discussion forum here, if you have any questions, like very technical questions, usually someone is always um, able to help with that. And also usually providing answers pretty fast, which is very impressive. You can see um, within the last couple of hours, there have been already lots of answers to particular very detailed questions here. So it's a very friendly and active community there. And it's also a very helpful resource for asking questions. So beyond just yeah, the class context. Okay, so in the next video, I will then introduce computation graphs. And then after we talked about computation graphs, I will explain to you how we utilize them for automatic differentiation in PyTorch.